teaser to let you know that we have a Beth Moore study starting. If you open up your bulletin, go to the middle section where the announcements are. It's right here, smack dab in the middle. Someone pointed out to me that I didn't say it in the first service, so I'll say it in this service. You'll see the very last line, the study is for both men and women. In the past, we've done some Beth Moore studies that were gauged just primarily for women. This is open to both genders. So gentlemen, you are welcome to attend that Beth Moore uh, Bible study. It's 11 weeks. You can read the specifics. Also, I want to point out that this is how you know what's happening at your church. We find an awful lot of these laying on the chairs after service or in the recycling bins. And if you're going to throw them away, please recycle. But we really wish you would take them home, read them, find out what's going on, and get involved with some of these things. Also, in the bulletin, on the back page, this... this uh page right here. This is how you communicate with us. I mean, this isn't the only way. You can email us. You can call us. You can, what is it called, Matt? Tweet us? Yeah, that's it. Uh, you can Facebook us. Um, but this is how you let us know what your interests are, things that you'd like to see, make comments. This is how you communicate back to us about your community service during the week, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that is all the announcements. So let me wish you Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And we are in this new year starting a new sermon series. Um, it is. Uh, it's titled Terms and Traditions. Today's sermon title. Didn't actually make it into the bulletin, but that's okay. The title for today's sermon is New Beginnings and New Birth. I think New Beginnings is a wonderful uh, way to start the new year. We're going to be entering into this six-week series on terms and traditions. Uh, and just so you know, here's what's coming up over the next few weeks. Today, we're doing regeneration or rebirth. Okay, uh, then we're going to do justification, then we're going to do sanctification, then we're going to get into some, those are the terms, then we're going to get into some of the traditions that are uh, specific to the Christian church, but, but also somewhat unique or kind of unique to the Churches of God General Conference. Uh, we're going to look at baptism, we're going to look at the Lord's Supper or communion, and then we're going to look at feet washing. So that's what's coming up over the next six weeks. Now, today, as I said, we're looking at regeneration. And regeneration is another term, or it's a, a long, like, it's, it's a nice big church word for rebirth or being born again. Uh, in John 3, a gentleman by the name of Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said, you know, we, we know you're from God. We know that you have authority. We know that, that you're the real deal, so to speak. And Jesus' response to him was, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So that is kind of the basis, that's the concept, that's the term that we're going to be exploring together today. We're going to be looking at regeneration. Before we look at our text, though, before we actually look into the book, let's go to God in prayer and ask him for direction in both understanding his word, but also in applying his word. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come to the book, as we come to your, uh, your word today, we ask that your spirit would lead and guide and and direct us in our study of your word. We ask that your, your spirit would, would help us, would give us uh, understanding. But Lord, we want more than an encounter with the written word. We want more than head knowledge. We want to encounter Jesus Christ, the living word. So allow your spirit to help us see the living word today as we look at this written word. Help us to see the word become flesh. And then through your spirit, Lord, empower us to not just understand this living word and encounter this living word and this written word, but help us to live it out. Help us to, to put it into practice. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So our primary text today is taken from the book of Titus, uh, verses 3 through 8. You can follow along on the screen. You can follow along in your Bibles and your chairs or your phones, whatever. Here we go. Titus 3, verses 3 through 8. Once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and we became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy and we hated each other. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. So in these few short verses, we have Paul, and in this, in this whole book of Titus, he's writing in what's called one of the pastoral epistles. Now, one of the things that's happened in the past is people hear pastoral epistle, and they think, oh, this is just a letter that Paul wrote to one of his under pastors, and it's not for the church, it's just for pastors. Well, here's the problem with that statement. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. We are all ministers. We are all pastors. This is not just a letter to professional pastors. This is not just a letter to clergy. This is a letter to the church. So Paul is writing to Titus, but he's writing to encourage him and the whole church at Crete and the church today. So in our text, it starts out by reminding them and... Likewise, by reminding us that we all started out in the same place. Every single one of us started out like it says in verse 3. Once we too were foolish. We were foolish. We were disobedient to the Creator. We're, we were misled. We, we truly believe that when we do what we want, when we want, we're free. Right? We have that, that fallacy sometimes that enters in. We, we fool ourselves. You know, I do what I want. You know, and when we think that way, we think that's, that, that's freedom. But Paul points out that in reality, that's just a form of slavery. We're just slaves to our lusts and our desires. We're captives to our own pleasures, to our own wants. And we're fooled into believing that freedom is doing what we want when we want. But the truth is, the truth is that at that point, our lives are really slavery. Our lives aren't our own. We're, we're slaves to our lust, to our desires, to our wants. And he goes on and he says that our lives are full of envy and they're full of evil and they're full of hatred. I don't know about you, but when I read verse 3, I look at it and go, ah, I think a change needs to happen here. I think something different needs to go on. We need to wake up. We need to realize the truth of our situation. We need to do this major turnaround. We need to do a 180 and get things headed in a different direction. We need a new, different life. And then we hit verse 4. And in verse 4, we have this Seemingly insignificant little conjunction, but. Little three-letter word, but. But this is a huge conjunction. The word but is defined as a conjunction used to express or point out a difference. So at the beginning of verse 4, Paul points out a different possibility to what he has described in verse 3. He uses the word but to start an introduction to a different life that is available. 
In verse 3, he's described us as foolish and disobedient slaves who are full of evil and envy and hatred. And in 4, he introduces an opposite possibility. An opposite possibility that's open to us. A new life that is available. Look again at verses 4 and 5. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. God our Savior... God, our Savior, revealed His nature, His kindness, and His love. And because of His nature of kindness and love, He saves us. And it's important here to notice, not because of anything we did, but because of His mercy. He washes away our sins. He gives us this new birth and this new life through the Holy Spirit. God, our Savior. That very statement says we need someone to save us. We need a Savior. We can't get ourselves out of the mess we're in. We can't get ourselves out of the trouble. We can't change our position before the Creator. We can't do it. We need someone to do it for us. We need a Savior. He revealed His love and kindness. God shows us what his nature is. He reveals this nature of love and kindness. He showed us this by rescuing us when we couldn't rescue ourselves. He showed us this by rescuing us from ourselves. Remember verse 3, we're foolish, we're disobedient, we're, you know, he rescues us from ourselves. It goes on and says he did it because he is merciful. Another part of his nature. He washes away our sins. He cleans us. He takes away the sin and the stain of the sin. We don't clean ourselves. We can't clean ourselves. We can't get ourselves cleaned up and presentable. He does it for us. And he gives us a fresh start, a clean slate, a new birth, a new life. And he does all this through the Holy Spirit. And then we continue into verse 6 and 7. This Holy Spirit, He generously poured out upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Another Savior mentioned here, the same Savior, God the Father, God the Son, working together. Because of His grace, He declared us righteous. And gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. The Holy Spirit is the agent of our washing, the agent of our new birth, our new life, our regeneration is generously poured out through Jesus Christ. And then it says, because of God's grace, he declares us righteous. We can't declare ourselves righteous any more than we can clean ourselves up. He declares that we are now righteous. And he gives us confidence in an eternal life that's available to us. And then we have verse 8. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. What's Paul saying here in verse 8? He's looking back at verses 4 through 7, and he's saying... These are trustworthy statements. These are dependable. These are teachable. These, these verses 4 through 7 are solid. You can put trust in them. You can believe in them. They are a good, solid anchor, a good statement of faith. They're called upon as teachings. A statement of faith that should be replicated, that should be taught over and over and over. And it should have a result. All who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. Those who hear it, those who hear this statement of faith, those who believe in this statement of faith, those who are engaged in this new life will exhibit their new life. 
by doing good. It's not a suggestion. This is presented as a natural occurrence, a natural outflow of that relationship. A natural outflow of that saving. Now, this is not a way to earn salvation. We've already said we can't get it ourselves. We can't do it ourselves. We need someone who will save us. We need a savior. But the result of that being saved is this uh, outflow of good works. If you look at James chapter 2, verse 26... It says, just as the body without breath or the spirit is dead, so also faith is dead without good works. So today we're looking at this term. We're looking at, at regeneration, rebirth, being born again. And like I said, this is, this is one of those wonderful, big theological words that we like to use. Regeneration. Sounds important, doesn't it? You know, and we're also going to look at justification and sanctification. We're going to look at a lot of shuns when we're done here. But it's just a big word that means rebirth, being born again. A person has to be regenerated. They have to be reborn. They must experience this new birth. But what do we learn from this Titus passage about that regeneration, about that rebirth, about that new life? Someone told me after the first service, oh, this is one of those sermons. And I said, excuse me? They said, well, first you told us what you were going to tell us, then you told us, and then you told us what you told us. And I'm like, what? They said, it's the old, tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. It's like a three-peat. That's what you're getting today. That's what this sermon is. So we're going to recap. We go back to verse 3. It says, left to our own devices, left to ourselves, we are foolish, we're disobedient to the Creator, we're misled, we're captives, we're slaves to our own wants and desires, we're full of evil, full of envy, full of hatred. And Paul points out pretty specifically, this is what we all were. At one point, you too were, is the way he says this. And we look again at 4 and 5. But God is our Savior. And God reveals His nature. He reveals His nature of love. He reveals His nature of kindness. And He makes this rescue plan, this salvation plan. Not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, not because we've done anything to get ourselves in a position for it. He does it because of his mercy. Because of his mercy. He washes away our sins. He washes away the stain. He gives us new birth, new life. And he does all this through the Spirit. And then we look at 6 and 7. He generously pours out that Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. I don't know if you noticed, but this is, this is one of those places where the salvation message is presented in Scripture. And it talks about all three of the Trinity. God, our Savior. Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Holy Spirit. All three are working, because they are one, are working as one for this outcome. God, our Savior, pours out the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. Because of His grace, we're counted as righteous. I had someone one time explain uh, grace as an acronym. If you know what acronyms are, that's where each letter is, is, a, is a word. You take the, the first letter of each word and it makes a new word. They said grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus told us we could have life. We could have life full and abundant. And this talks about that eternal life that we look forward to. All of that is part of being joint heirs. Part of being a child of God. Part of being adopted into the family. We get God's riches and Christ has paid the freight. Christ has paid the bill. So God's riches at Christ's expense because of his grace we're counted as righteous. God now sees us as righteous before him. 
And because of that, we can have confidence in our eternal life. And then we get back to verse 8. All of this, all of this, this verse 4 through 7, all of this statement of faith is dependable. It's trustworthy. It's to be taught and taught and taught. But it's not taught so that we have head knowledge. It's not taught so that we have it memorized and can recite it. It's not taught so that it's up here. It's taught so that it works its way into here and changes our lives. It's taught so that it becomes part of us. And then there's an outflow. We're taught so that we no more live as verse 3 people. Full of evil and envy and hatred. Foolish, disobedient, misled, captive, slaves. We're taught so that there's a change in our lives. And in that change, we've gone from that verse 3, evil, envy, foolishness, disobedience, slavery, and hatred. And it is replaced by God's very nature. We become like our Savior. We become kind and loving and merciful and gracious. Our nature changes. We become more like the Father and His Son through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We then are people of love and kindness and mercy and grace. And being people of love and kindness and mercy and grace, that new life works itself out as we live it in our good deeds, our good works. They don't buy our salvation but our salvation outflows in those things. This rebirth, this new life, this, this regeneration should make us different. And that difference is not just to be kept internally. It's supposed to be lived out. It's a new life after all. So go and live the new life. That's your first admonition for that. Go and live the new life that you have. And if you don't have this new life, if you're not too sure that this is who you are, if you still think you might be a verse 3 person instead of a verse 4 through 7 person, talk to Pastor Matt, talk to me, talk to one of the band, talk to anybody in here who's, who's a regular, and they'll, if they can't tell you about the gift, they'll point you to someone who will. This rebirth, this new life, this regeneration is available to everyone. And according to Romans 6.23, it's a gift. You can't buy it. You can't get it on eBay or Amazon. You can't go out and find it. It's a gift that's provided to you by God the Father. Through Jesus in the indwelling of the Spirit. It's a gift. So the second thing I leave you with is a question. Have you received that gift? If you have, go and live out the new life. If you haven't, talk to one of us. We'll help you understand it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for this word in Titus. This, uh, it's a short passage, Lord, but, but it's full. It's rich. It says so much to us. It tells us about who we were. It tells us about where we existed before the evil, the envy, the hatred, the disobedience, the foolishness, the slavery. And then verse 4 hits us with that conjunction, but there's a different way. There's a new life available. There's a, a rebirth, a regeneration. Because God our Savior reveals His true nature, His love, and His kindness. And He saves us. He washes us. He declares us righteous. And in that there's confidence. Not just in an eternal life, but in a full, abundant life now. There's a rebirth. Lord, help us to, to not just understand this text, but to, to hear it echoing in our ears as we live our life every day. Help us to live that new life. Help us to be those reborn, rebirth, regenerated people. And through that, Lord, help us to draw others. The people who are still in, in verse 3. Help us show them the, the truth, the trustworthiness of what you've done.
Give us the strength to live out this life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as the band comes back...